Chapter 1 of The Adventures of an Ugly Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zarina Silverman, Los Angeles, California. The Adventures of an Ugly Girl by Elizabeth Burgoyne Corbett. Chapter 1. As Ither See Us, Burns. Come, Dora. I shall never be ready if you don't make haste. They will be here in ten minutes, and my hair is not half so nice as it ought to be, thanks to your carelessness. You are very good to ignore my own claims to attention so utterly. I have been helping you this half hour, and have barely time enough left to change my frock. To make my own hair presentable is impossible now. Why? What does it matter how your hair is dressed, or what sort of a gown you put on? You may just as well spare your pains, for unfortunately nothing that you can do seems to mitigate your ugliness. I'm sure I cannot think where you get it. You are. But somehow I did not feel inclined to wait for the end of Bell's encouraging lecture. Perhaps it was because I was so often treated to my beautiful elder sister's homilies that they had lost the spark of novelty and had acquired a chestnutty flavor. Perhaps I failed to recognize any generosity in her persistent efforts to nip such latent buds of vanity as from time to time tried to thrust their poor little heads above the chill crust of ridicule and contumely. Perhaps I was really as bad-tempered as I was said to be. Anyhow, my behavior could not claim to be either quiet or elegant, as I stormily quitted Belle's room, slamming the door behind me with such violence as to elicit from my more well-bred sister a little shriek of affected dismay. So far from feeling sorry that I had given Belle's nerves a shock, I wished viciously that her fingers had been jammed in the doorway, or that something equally disastrous had occurred to take off the edge of her conceit and self-satisfaction. In the corridor, I met my brother Jerry, of whom I was devotedly fond. But although he had evidently some interesting remark to make, I did not stop to speak to him, but hurried noisily to my own room, where I locked myself in and threw myself on the bed to give way to a storm of sobs and tears. And all for what, it may be asked? Surely a spiteful remark from one sister to another is hardly worth all this display of feeling. Ah, well, perhaps one such remark now and then might be treated with the cool contempt which spiteful utterances deserve. But does the reader know what it is to be perpetually and persistently snubbed from one year's end to the other? Does he realize how hard it must be for a sensitive and love-craving girl to be reminded that she is ugly and unattractive? Not reminded once in a way, either, but pretty nearly every day of her life. Or does anyone doubt how the heart must needs ache to see all the love and flattery of friends and relations alike showered upon a being whom you know to be empty-headed and frivolous, while everybody seems to regard your plain exterior as sufficient reason why you should be snubbed and neglected? If the reader has ever had any of these experiences, he will the more readily understand my inability to restrain my tears on the especial occasion just mentioned. For it really was a very especial occasion, and I had been more anxious to look well at this particular moment than I ever remembered to have been in my life. I had hoped that Belle, just for once in a way, would take a little interest in my personal appearance, and that she would help me to create as good an impression as possible upon the newcomer whose advent I had both dreaded and longed for. But Belle was too self-engrossed, and too firmly convinced of my hopeless unpresentability, to give the slightest thought either to me or to my feelings. Nay, she had even claimed so much of my time in the task of enhancing her own beauty that, as we have seen, I had only a few minutes left for myself, and even this morsel of time was not utilized by me, as things turned out. The fact is, I was anxious and overwrought, and Belle's unkind speeches had multiplied all day until they had utterly broken my composure. Can it really be true, I wondered in abject misery? 
that nothing I can either do or wear will help to mitigate the first feeling of repulsion which my new mother must necessarily experience at the sight of my ugliness. The question was of very vital import to me, for I longed for the advent of at least one sympathetic woman in the house, and when I heard that my father, now three years a widower, was about to marry again, I hoped, with a fervor that was nearly akin to agony, that his second wife would be the friend I so sorely needed. True, she would be my stepmother, and she would naturally assume the direction of the household affairs, at once placing the daughters of the house in a subordinate position. This being the case, I believe it would have been more orthodox to have railed against the new invasion, and to have followed the prevailing social custom of resolving to make life miserable for the woman who had presumed to step into my mother's place. But I always was terribly unorthodox in many things, and, considerably to my father's surprise, I expressed my enthusiastic delight at the prospect of having a stepmother to reign over me. He need not have been surprised if he had ever taken the trouble to understand me. But he was wrapped up in Belle's charms, and never looked at me without regretting either my ugliness or my temper, which all in the house, except dear little Jerry, pronounced unbearable. And yet I can truthfully say that if I had experienced anything approaching to just treatment, I should have been infinitely sweeter tempered than my much bepraised sister, than whom none could have been more unfeeling to the motherless girl whose heart ached for a little love. I generally did Belle's bidding, for she always contrived to make things unpleasant for me if I rebelled against her authority. But to Lady Elizabeth Courtney, I felt ready to yield the most devoted service and obedience, if only she would love me just a little in return, and I had anxiously revolved every means of creating a favorable impression upon her. I meant to have taken considerable pains with my toilette, and to have welcomed the homecoming bride with radiant smiles. And this was how my good resolves had ended. Just when... After working hard all day to see that everything was conducive to a warm and comfortable homecoming, I had begun to hurry through my toilette. I was summoned to Belle's aid, with the result that instead of giving my stepmother a smiling welcome, I was up in my own room, with a face red and swollen with weeping, and a heart full of angry feeling when she arrived. Presently, I heard a carriage approaching, and at the same instant, Jerry knocked vigorously at my bedroom door. "'Be quick and come down, Dory!' he cried, in an eager, excited voice. "'Papa and Lady Elizabeth are nearly here, and I want you to run down the avenue with me to meet them.' "'I'm not coming,' I answered, with a sob that was audible to Jerry, and provoked him to quick wrath. "'I knew she would!' he exclaimed. That horrid Belle's been at her tricks again and said something nasty. But don't let her have the best of you like that. Don't you know that you promised to go with me to meet them, and if you don't come they won't believe you're glad about it. I can't help it, Jerry, was my mournful reply. I look so hideous just now that I could not possibly face a stranger. Run off quickly yourself. Say that I have a headache or something of the sort, and that I shall try to sleep it off. Run now, there's a dear boy. And forthwith, Jerry, whose real name, by the by, is Gerald Mortimer Courtney, ran along the corridor, down the wide, shallow stairs, across the tiled hall, and into the open air, just as the carriage containing the newly married pair drove into the large graveled space in which the Chestnut Avenue terminated. In spite of my discomfiture and unpresentable appearance, I possessed my due share of curiosity, and hastily jumped to my feet, crossed the room, and looked through the window at the prancing horses and elegant equipage which bore the newcomers. As soon as the carriage stopped, a liveried footman descended and opened the door with a flourish. By the time he had let the steps down, Belle and Jerry were at the carriage door and I saw Mr. and Lady Elizabeth Courtney get out and exchange smiles and kisses with my sister and brother, while I, poor pariah, looked on with hungry eyes and an aching heart, and bewailed my luck in seeming ill-natured and inhospitable, 
after all my efforts to prove the contrary. Lady Elizabeth, I must explain, had had some love passages with my father a long time ago, but their youthful desires had been taught to bow to the demands of fortune and position. Lady Elizabeth was the daughter of an earl, and could aspire to more material comforts than could have been provided for her by the penniless younger son of a country squire. True, the earl had no money, and what little land was still left him was mortgaged up to the hilt. But he had many friends who possessed sufficient influence to pitchfork his four sons into government sinecures. He had a cousin also, the Duchess of Lindine, who chaperoned his handsome, clever daughter through two whole seasons, and eventually resigned her charge into the care of Samuel Chisholm, Esquire, once upon a time a shoeblack, now the proud possessor of twenty thousand a year, all made by the judicious advertisement of his prize patent blacking. Upon the whole, the Earl's daughter was supposed to have done tolerably well for herself, and, as her husband's fortune steadily increased, there was every reason for her to feel satisfied. Even the encumbrance which she had been compelled to take with the fortune was not especially disagreeable to her, for Mr. Chisholm was a very clever man, whose mental and social equipments kept pace with his fortunes, and, in spite of his low origin and antecedents, he was as courtly and well-bred as Lady Elizabeth's nobly-born brothers. The pair, therefore, lived harmoniously enough together, at least to outward seeming, for many years. Then Mr. Chisholm died somewhat suddenly, and his will was read in due course. It was during that important ceremony that the unexpectedly bereaved widow first felt real resentment against her late husband. For though he had died a millionaire, he had only willed his wife a life interest of five thousand a year, which was quite a paltry income compared with the princely revenue she had expected to be hers. To her father a like fortune was bequeathed, in addition to a sum of thirty thousand pounds wherewith to redeem his impoverished estate. The widow's brothers each received a gift of five thousand pounds, and to the widow herself was willed all the personal property of the deceased. All the rest of his vast fortune was divided among a swarm of poor relations, whose existence Lady Elizabeth had never acknowledged, but who no doubt showered blessings on the memory of the dead man who had thus befriended his own flesh and blood. The Earl of Greatlands, too, declared himself delighted with his son-in-law's generosity. But his daughter did not hesitate to say that she had been treated shamefully, and at once proclaimed her intention of resigning the tenancy of the costly London establishment, which it would be a farce to attempt to keep up on five thousand a year. She retired to a pretty place in the country, declining to reside with her father, who, elated by his unwonted prosperity, was actually talking of taking a young wife to comfort his old age. My father had, meanwhile, married my mother, whose memory I adore, for she loved me passionately, and while she lived I was never humiliated, as was perpetually the case after her death, which occurred some three years before my story opens. I do not remember hearing how my father came across Lady Elizabeth again, but I believe that their early attachment soon reasserted itself, and though he was much the poorer of the two, and encumbered with three children, the match was soon arranged. Although Lady Elizabeth had been dissatisfied with her widow's portion, she was very much richer than we were, and her coming to Courtney Grange was likely to be a very important event to the previous humble inhabitants thereof. In addition to the Grange, which had been my maternal grandfather's property, my father had just six hundred a year, derived partly from what his father had left him, partly from my mother's small fortune. Our establishment consisted of two servants, in addition to the family. Their names were John and Martha Page. They had never seen any other service but that of my father and grandfather, and had lived seventeen years under the same roof before it entered their heads to amalgamate their interests by marrying. They were quite used to the constant scraping and economizing which we were compelled to practice, and did not look upon the arrival of a new mistress as an unmixed blessing, even though she was bringing a good income with her. As for Belle, 
She was quite wild with delight at the gorgeous prospect which opened itself before her mental vision. London seasons, presentations at court, halcyon days of brilliant pleasure, and a swarm of dukes and earls sighing for the honor of her hand. These were some of the glowing visions in which she indulged. And I mean to get into Lady Elizabeth's good graces, whether I like her or not, she informed me. She can do so much for me if she likes, and I can be amiability itself when I like. Besides, my looks will win her over at once. She will soon see what credit I can do to pretty gowns. As for you, you'll be lucky if she tolerates you at all. I'm sure it's a shame that our family's reputation for beauty should suffer as it does through you. And so on, ad libitum. Of course, I was not surprised to see her warm, gushing welcome of my father and his wife, nor to note the glance of surprised admiration which the latter cast upon Belle and Gerald, for they were really both very beautiful, and both tall and well-grown, with lovely golden hair, rich deep blue eyes, and an exquisite complexion united to perfect features. Lady Elizabeth, too, I was sorry to see, was a tall, handsome woman, who by no means looked her forty years. When I say that I was sorry to observe this, it must not be imagined that I grudged her her good looks, but I had had a vague notion that if she were comparatively plain, she would the more easily sympathize with my troubles, into which no one in the house except Jerry seemed able to enter. Now my hopes in that direction were upset, and I already knew instinctively that my own absence was being commented upon. I saw my father, the very picture of masculine comeliness, glance up at my window with an angry frown, and I knew almost as well as if I had been present what Belle and Jerry were saying about me. After all, I thought, I had been very foolish to let Belle's ill nature and my own ill temper spoil my resolve to make Lady Elizabeth's homecoming as pleasant as possible. Apart from looks, my remaining upstairs would have already made me lose ground with my stepmother. Was it too late, I wondered, to rectify my error and make my appearance before dinner was served? Answering the question in the negative, I resolved to complete my toilette as quickly as possible and get over the ordeal of the first meeting without further loss of time. So I began operations at once, wondering, while I brushed my hair, how it was that I was so different to Jerry and Belle. I pulled faces at my own ugly reflection in the glass, but as that only seemed to make matters worse, I desisted. But I could not banish the discontent which enhanced my ugliness and made it almost perfect in its own way. Why was I so short and dumpy? I asked myself vainly. And why was my hair so black and lank and scanty? And how was it that my complexion was more like Thames mud than anything else? And why was my face covered with freckles? These freckles I always felt to be an especial aggravation of nature, for who ever heard of freckles on a dark, sallow skin? And then, how did it happen that my eyes were of a pale, watery brown hue, while I had hardly got either eyelashes or eyebrows that were visible? And why, oh why, had my nose got that exasperating habit of looking skyward? Even as I asked these questions of myself, I felt how hopeless it was to attempt to answer them. So I abandoned them, and tried to console myself with the reflection that my mouth was well-shaped and that I had splendid teeth. But then my great red hands obtruded themselves upon my notice and blotted out all consciousness of my redeeming features. I took considerable pains with my hair and put on my best dress. Alas! The latter was of a curious brown shade, which somehow only seemed to enhance my ugliness. Belle was dressed in a dainty pink cambric, but I was never allowed such a luxury, as it was considered that I was too untidy, and too plain, and altogether too unsuitable to indulge in pretty things. Besides, we had to be economical, and as I could never hope to captivate a lover, no matter how I was dressed, it would have been a shame to waste money upon my futile adornment. 
So Bell argued, and I had hitherto had no choice but to bow to her arguments. I was at last ready to go downstairs, when once more Jerry came to look me up. "'Oh, you're donned up, are you?' he remarked. "'And upon my word, you're looking quite spry.' But I was not to be soothed by such negative flattery as this, and sternly asked Jerry what he meant by looking quite spry. "'Why spry? You know, spry means, at least I mean, that you look as if you were going to a prayer meeting. That is, you look so prim and tidy and straight. But, Dory, dear, I like you far better as you were this morning, and as you generally are. You look real jolly, then.' Saying this, Jerry kissed me warmly, and I forthwith resigned myself to the hopelessness of attempting to improve my appearance. This morning I had worn an old lilac print that had originally been made for Belle. It was faded with much washing, and possessed sundry little adornments in the way of frayed edges and sleeves out at elbows. Truly, Belle had been right after all, and it was sheer folly on my part to rebel against fate, since neither coaxing nor rebelling seemed to propitiate her. Seeing, therefore, how stern and uncompromising she was with me, I resolved to take less notice of her in future, and had no sooner made the resolve than I began to feel peaceful and self-possessed. What if the gift of beauty was denied me? Had I not many other blessings to be thankful for? In all my seventeen years of life, I had never had anything but the most robust health, and if my school record was anything to go by, I possessed a much more valuable property in the way of brains than Bell did. These should outweigh my physical defects and prove my passport to the world's good graces. I dare say Jerry was rather surprised to see me suddenly straighten myself up and assume a much more cheerful expression. "'What is Lady Elizabeth like?' I asked. "'Looks?' "'No ways.' "'Well, I take her to be rather a brick, do you know? She was as pleasant and as much at home with Belle and me as if she had lived here all her life and had just been off for a holiday. She thinks we're just like Pa, and that is high praise, I should fancy.' Very high praise, Jerry. I wonder what she'll say about me. But it doesn't matter. Is dinner nearly served? Yes, but John was grumbling because you hadn't helped to see that the table was all right, as you had promised to do. Oh, poor John. It was a shame of me to forget all about him. I'll hurry down now and see what I can do. Come on, Jerry. A minute later, we were both skipping nimbly downstairs, and while Jerry, at my earnest request, ran round to the stable to see how my bull terrier Bobby was progressing, I ran into the kitchen to make my peace with John and Martha. As Martha was somewhat sulky, and protested that they had managed very well without me, I made my way to the dining room, and began swiftly to rearrange the flowers which I had culled for the table earlier in the day. John looked rather scandalized, and remarked that he thought he knew how to arrange a table as well as most folks. But I did not heed John's grumbling much, for it was his chronic condition, and I had just completed my little task to my own satisfaction when John rang the second dinner bell, the first not having been noticed by me. Just then Jerry came back. "'Bobby will be all right in a day,' he said, whereat I expressed my satisfaction." for I had been greatly troubled when poor Bobby had come limping home with every sign of war about him. And oh, I said, with sudden remembrance, what has been done with the wonderful carriage and pair and those gorgeous servants? They went straight home. They belong to the Earl. He sent them to meet Lady Elizabeth at the station. Her own carriages are coming after she has seen what arrangements it will be best to make here. I fancy she doesn't like the place very much. "'Not like the Grange?' I exclaimed indignantly. "'Why, she must be a veritable heathen.' "'Dora, I regret that you should think fit to behave so badly, "'but must demand a little of your attention "'while I introduce you to the notice of Lady Elizabeth Courtney. "'Was ever luck like mine?' Here had I quite lost sight of the fact that my father and his wife might enter the room at any time, and they had actually overheard me speak in tones of contempt of the one woman on earth whom I wished to propitiate. 
I turned hurriedly round and saw my father looking very irate, Lady Elizabeth looking coldly critical, and Belle looking ill-naturedly triumphant. I beg your pardon, Papa. I did not mean it, I stammered. No, I do not suppose you did mean us to overhear you, he replied sternly. But I have no doubt that you had resolved to be intensely disagreeable, and I tell you plainly that I will not have it. You see, my love, he said, turning to his wife, you will have a little temper and self-will to deal with, but I am sure you will know how to compel it to keep within due bounds. What could I do or say after that? Nothing, of course, and I sat miserably through the whole meal, while all but Jerry laughed and talked as if quite unconscious of my presence. I would fain have escaped to my own room when the dinner was over, but my father had taken it into his head that I merely wanted to be obstinate and disagreeable, and suggested that I should spend an hour in the drawing room. I accordingly took refuge at the piano, but my music was so melancholy that I am not surprised that I was asked to desist, for... When you come to think of it, Killigrew's Lament and The Dead March and Saul haven't a very bridal sound about them. So far, Lady Elizabeth had not spoken directly to me, and whenever my eyes wandered in her direction, I could see that her glance was very critical, but I could not be sure that it was quite so disapproving as I had expected. Yet, although I neither spoke nor was spoken to, there was no constraint between the others, for my father and Lady Courtney were both good conversationalists, and Belle could chatter by the hour, provided the talk was kept at a suitably frivolous level. Jerry, after being petted and praised a little, had been sent to bed primed with a quartet of kisses and jubilant in the possession of a bright sovereign which Papa had given to him in honor of the advent of a new mistress at Courtney Grange. Bell, dear, suppose you play us one of your pretty pieces, said my father. Whereupon I vacated the music stool and took refuge near the big oriel window which overlooked the orchard and which was my especial delight. For it was like a small room in itself and I did not feel quite so lost among its cosy faded draperies as I did in any other part of our drawing room which always seemed to me to be much too large for the furniture that was in it. Bell, after a great deal of fidgeting and looking round at herself, to make sure that her dress was falling in graceful folds, struck a few chords on what had been a very fine piano in its day, but which even I, who was partial to all that had belonged to my mother, was compelled to admit was getting out of date. "'I really don't like to let you hear me for the first time on an old instrument like this, Lady Elizabeth,' said Bell. If my music strikes you disagreeably, pray make all due allowance for the difficulties under which I labor. Pray don't apologize, my dear, answered Lady Elizabeth. I know how to separate the faults of the instrument from those of the player, and the quality of the piano need not trouble you long, as in all probability a grand of my own will be here in a day or two. How delightful, exclaimed Belle and then she proceeded to give us a specimen of the skill which, times without number, I had been advised to emulate. She played the rippling cascade in a style that was faultless as regards time and precision, following it up with the musical box. But her playing was utterly devoid of expression. Pathos, tenderness, power, fire were all unknown musical quantities to her, as they are, alas, to numbers of other conventional players, and whether it was Home Sweet Home or the Soldier's Chorus, each and everything was played with the same clockwork insensibility to all the laws of expression. I watched Lady Elizabeth narrowly as she listened to Bell's efforts in the musical line, and, shall I own it? I was maliciously glad to notice a distinctly bored expression steal across her features. There was one thing in which I could excel my usually all-conquering sister, of which the lady whom we both desired to please was evidently a judge, and I could not help rejoicing in the fact that I was not quite weaponless in the fight for favor, though I had certainly done anything but shine so far. What do you think of Belle's performance? 
asked my father, either forgetful of my presence or not caring whether I overheard the conversation or not. Lady Elizabeth's reply, though given in a low tone and under cover of the music, reached my ears quite distinctly. She is just a trifle disappointing there, Gerald. I should imagine your younger daughter, Dora, to be much the better artist of the two. She seems to be a trifle wild and ungovernable, but would, I think, be amenable to reason with judicious handling. My dear Elizabeth, you don't know her yet. Wait until you have seen more of her, and then you will agree with me that she is more than trying. Indeed, she is positively exasperating at times. Belle always has some complaint to make of her, and I am not surprised that this should be so, for it is a matter of impossibility to make her either look or act like a lady. No one would dream that she was a Courtney. Often and often I had felt my heart ache at the neglect and carelessness with which my father had always treated me, and I had grieved bitterly at the lack of outward comeliness which seemed to be the passport to his affection. But that he was actually so devoid of parental feeling as to show himself positively antipathetic to me had never occurred to me. Now, as I heard him saying things which must make me almost hateful in Lady Elizabeth's eyes, I felt myself hardened toward him, and the love which I had hitherto cherished for him fell from me like a worn-out mantle. What, oh, what had I ever done that he should do that which presumably only my bitterest enemy would do to me? Why should he try to prejudice me in the eyes of his wife? Had he no remembrance of the mother who loved me with a love equal to that which she bore for himself and his happier children? Was he quite forgetful of all the little efforts I had always made to increase his comfort? Did he really regard me as quite removed from the sphere of a lady, because I had worked hard and made my hands red and unsightly, ever since I had realized how difficult it was for Martha and John to manage our big house efficiently without assistance? I, in my blindness, had hoped that he would commend me for my industrious habits, and it was a bitter awakening to discover that he only rated me on a par with, perhaps, a scullery maid. I could feel my eyes begin to gain the fire they usually lacked, and the hot blood suffused my cheeks as I sat trembling with anger and fighting madly to prevent myself from uttering the reproaches that forced themselves to my lips. It would be well, I thought, to keep quiet until the end of the play and hear the verdict which Lady Elizabeth would pronounce upon me. I therefore listened for her answer with tightly clasped hands and motionless form, but with my attention strained to the utmost, Belle having meanwhile reached the most flourishy part of household harmonies. Do you think it quite fair to the child, said my stepmother? to give implicit credence to what one sister says to the detriment of the other, without giving the latter a chance to defend herself? Do not imagine for a moment I have a thought of reproaching you. But I cannot help contrasting the love and admiration you so openly display for Belle with the coldness and actual displeasure with which you look at Dora. May not this have much to do with the girl's presumably bad temper and gauche manners? You see, I want to make the best of all belonging to you, Gerald, and I am inclined to think that there is more in your younger daughter than you have given her credit for. I should be only too glad to discover a single good quality in Dora, replied my affectionate father. But I repeat that she is really hopeless, and assure you, for your own future guidance, that her disposition is on a par with her looks than which nothing could very well be more disappointing, considering the fact that she is the offspring of a house which for generations has been famous for its beauty. But a beautiful body does not invariably hold a beautiful mind, and of course the obverse rule holds good. The fact is, I am not sure that I have not taken a fancy to Dora. I have an idea that she is a girl of great possibilities, under judicious management. Certainly appearances are against her at present, but appearances are but very circumstantial evidence at best. And how do you get over her rudeness to you on your arrival? You mean her failure to meet me at the door? 
Yes. Well, I rather fancy that if I had been in her place, I should have done the same. It is bad enough to be such a contrast in looks to her handsome sister, without having her plainness accentuated and aggravated by the most unbecoming attire that could possibly have been procured for her. Belle is beautifully dressed, and Dora's frock is simply hideous. Her hair, too, is plastered down in as ugly a fashion as possible. I mean to alter all that, and the result will astonish you, I am sure. By this time, Belle had noticed that she had an unappreciative audience, and was closing the piano, contriving to display, as she did so, a certain amount of well-bred annoyance, as I knew instinctively without looking at her, so well was I used to her little ways. Lady Elizabeth smiled pleasantly and said, Thank you, my dear. My father, considerably to Belle's own wonderment, appeared quite oblivious of her beautiful presence, a thing she had never had to complain of before. He looked like a man suddenly confronted with a new and mysterious riddle, and as if he were not sure whether he ought not to doubt the sanity of anyone who could deliberately say anything in favor of me. True, old Martha and her husband were sometimes quite ungrudging of their commendation, after I had been specially useful to them, but they were only servants, and it was perhaps natural that they should judge things in a different way to more educated people. As for me, I sat like one in ecstasy, for I had at last found someone who was not only willing, but actually determined to see that I was treated in a manner equal to the other daughter of the house, and not relegated to the position of a menial. My father had evidently forgotten that I was in the room, Lady Elizabeth thought I had left it, as was evidenced by her parting words to Belle as the latter was going up to her own bedroom. "'Good night, Belle,' she said. "'Tomorrow we will have a talk about what we will do together in future, eh? And tell your sister that I hope she will be well enough to go on an exploring expedition with me. I'm sure she has a pretty garden and other interesting things of her own to show me. She looks like a real lover of nature.' Had my heart not been so full of conflicting emotion, I could have laughed at Belle's stare of surprise. But laughter would have been horrible to me just then, and would have seemed a desecration of the purer sounds that rose to my lips. Does the reader know how it feels to be in a state of joy so exquisite that it is difficult to restrain the voice from shrieking aloud and the limbs from dancing in wild abandonment? Even so did I feel when I rose from my chair as Belle left the room. But my excitement ran into the channels of gratitude and love, and I soon found myself kneeling at Lady Elizabeth's feet, sobs shaking my frame, tears streaming down my cheeks, and broken words of feeling issuing from my lips. Dear, dear lady, I cried. Oh, how I bless you for your kind words. You don't know how I have hungered for love. You don't know what a grief it was to me to seem rude to you. You don't know how grateful I can be. I will do anything for you. I will work my fingers to the bone if you wish it. I will lay my life down for you if you will only give me just a little corner of your heart, just a little of the sympathy for which my heart has been aching. My dear child, said my stepmother, as she clasped me warmly to her breast, while genuine tears of sympathy actually rolled down her cheeks. My poor Dora, of course I mean to love you, and I want you to remember that I am your mother, to whom you must come in all your troubles. Then, with an affectionate kiss, she released me, and I fled to my bedroom, sobbing still with excitement, but proud, happy, and exultant, as I had never been in my life. She is an angel, I thought rapturously. Oh, how happy we shall be now! Alas, poor mortal, it is well for thee that the portals of the future are impervious to thy gaze, and that it is forbidden thee to know how small is perhaps thy destined share of happiness, the true elixir of life. End of chapter 1 Recording by Zarina Silverman, Los Angeles, California